As you may recall, I said that as a woman in the Special Operations Executive F section, you will be given one of two jobs, one being a courier and the other a wireless operator. And that is what they chose me to do. So here is my new best friend, my wireless set. The course at Tame Park in Oxfordshire was long and complicated, but I have been taught how to do Morse code at speeds of up to 24 words a minute. GPO telegraphists only do 12 words a minute. And here is my Morse key. So I tap this and the sound makes all the way back to England. Listening in England will be my godmother, a member of the first aid nursing yeomanry, and she will have been taught how to recognise my fist. That's the way that I tap Morse code. I've also been taught to put in a true and false check so that people listening at home will know whether or not I am operating under duress. We have to learn our codes off by heart and it's imperative that we don't keep anything written down. And so my memory is much better than it ever used to be. And so here is the wireless set. I've learned how to use all the different parts of it. I have the power line here going into the mains electricity, which is a little bit dicey. And sometimes we're told to use car batteries and then the aerial. Now, I've heard some girls in the field are very clever at disguising the aerials. One girl in particular puts it along her washing line. Then we have the valves and the most important thing, the crystal, which helps set the frequency. These crystals are brought to us by brave couriers and they risk life and limb to make sure that we can use our wireless equipment. But we risk life and limb too. You see, every time I put on the headset, and I start listening out. I am at risk of capture by the Gestapo. As I've already said, it only takes them about 20 minutes to hone in on an illegal wireless signal. The suitcase radio is very clever. We can put things over the top of it, such as cosmetics or medical equipment, to make it look like we're representatives of those particular professions. And we can carry the suitcase around. I'll be honest, it weighs an absolute ton, but as long as we can make it look like it's just a normal suitcase, perhaps we will get away with it. But we are the only members of the SOE or the resistance who carry our tools of trade with us. And if we are caught, then we will find ourselves in great trouble. We've been told to withstand interrogation for up to 24 hours. And Buckmaster told us that as wireless operators, our life expectancy it's only six weeks. I thought that I would show you some of the gadgets and gubbins that we're trained with at the SOE training schools, the STS special training schools. We've been taught all sorts of things that I never dreamed possible before the war broke out. Been taught how to blow things up, how to shoot things and of course self-defense. And so I thought I would take you through one or two of the objects that I've become very familiar, familiar with over the last few weeks. First of all, I thought perhaps we would take a look at the various knives and daggers that we've been taught how to use. Perhaps the most famous one is this, the Fairburn and Sykes, also known as the F and S and used by the commandos. Fairburn and Sykes are two instructors of ours who worked in Shanghai alongside the police there to try and deal with the drugs problem. This knife is held in the palm of the hand and is used in a swift stabbing motion. Some of the other knives that we've been taught how to use are to be hidden about the person. For example, this one, the thumb knife or lapel knife, which is hidden in the lapel of one's jacket. Or this, the sleeve dagger, which is hidden beneath the sleeve of one's jumper or coat and which has a particularly nasty triform point. My favourite, though, is this, the hat pin dagger. All of us ladies, when out and about, wear our hats and we hold them in place with a pin. So if you make it just a little bit stronger and a little bit pointier, well, that's certainly going to ruin somebody's day. One of the other sharp objects that we've been taught how to use is this, the caltrop. Well, this has been around for thousands of years. The Romans used these against horses' hooves, but they're equally effective against the rubber of a German tyre. We lay those in the road. The Germans 
drive over them, have a burst tyre, jump out to see why, and we lay about them using our Sten guns. Speaking of which, the Sten gun, which you saw earlier, a sub-automatic machine gun, which can be used both as repeating and as an automatic. It has 32 of these rounds, the 9mm, and it's a particularly effective weapon in an open area. That said, it's not terribly accurate, and with the open spring mechanism that you see here on the other side, can be prone to jamming, or indeed going off on its own. Another assassin's weapon, if you like, is this, the well rod, developed in Well and Garden City. In fact, anything with the prefix well was developed there. The well rod is a suppressed weapon. This means it's effectively silent apart from the moving mechanisms. Again, it carries the 9mm. And then we are taught how to blow things up. One of the primary objectives of the Special Operations Executive is sabotage, blowing up factories or railways. Particularly effective for this is plastic explosive. It comes wrapped like this, but effectively looks like yellow plasticine. This is a part of a railway line. A fog signal is laid some 30 feet up the line or so, and then as the train hits the fog signal, which they're perfectly used to seeing on the railways and won't think twice about it, this cord detonates the plastic explosive and blows a hole in the line. We're not looking to blow up the train, but to derail it, and this can cause havoc as a stalled locomotive can block the line for weeks, even months. Another thing we use to blow things up are these timer pencils. These can go off anything between half an hour to a month after we have laid them. They are relatively effective, although it has taken some development to get them absolutely right. And then the hand grenade, almost unchanged from the First World War. This, when it explodes, explodes into uh, small fragments or shrapnel and can cause immense damage, particularly in small areas. And another, although ladies don't get a cigarette ration out in France, is this, the exploding cigarette. At the bottom of the cigarette is incendiary powder. And so this can be used to set fire to something as a cigarette butt is dropped into uh, some kindling or into something that's already been laid or can be particularly painful to a German officer if you offer him a cigarette. Another is the pressure switch. This is set off and something heavy is put on top of it. And when the heavy item is lifted, the whole thing blows up. One last thing that we are taught is the art of clandestinity. And we have to use dead letter drops. We have to find ingenious ways of hiding things. Messages in cigarettes or in newspapers written on onion skins, and these are particularly good. Bolts with a top that unscrews, hollowed out on the inside, so that a message can be laid. So these are just a handful of things that we have learned how to use at the special training schools. And when we go into occupied territory, I just hope that some of these things are made available to us and we can go out and fulfil our mission of setting Europe ablaze.